Hello and again, welcome again to our sacred history and we're looking now at the beginning of our journey. We spent the last two videos kind of building up to that and where we're using our starting off point is at the beginning of the major um, Egyptian culture when it starts to grow and then um, there are obviously points before that because I know that will get asked um, in the comments and the sections later but there's a reason why we're starting here and we will look at the points before that as we go back um, in, in another series or a later topic but for now this we're going to use this as a starting point because it's the beginning of uh, a specific period and line of knowledge and development within the um, western culture and there's a few things, it's, quite, it's going to be quite a big topic uh, in this first video because we've got a lot to cover so we're probably going to break it down into multiple parts and what we, what's important is that we're going to start by looking at our first individual because when we looked at the introduction we saw that knowledge is passed from person to person um, and that's what we're going to follow and that shapes the events of history. Um, almost preceding the event because it's knowledge and information that creates an action or inspires an action to occur. You know, we don't invade a country unless we have a plan or knowledge of what we're going to do with it. It's not a knee-jerk reaction. And obviously, a lot of the time, it is based on kind of rulership and the person leading the country because at this point in time, we're looking at like 3,400 BC where you know the tribal community is quite large and that's the kind of basis we're looking at so when a ruler of that tribe emerges it's usually because the person has a greater understanding or knowledge or vision of what can be achieved as a community and we saw that um, we started our journey off from uh, the kind of fall of Mesopotamia or the first fall of Mesopotamia because there was a few few parts to that it's a re reoccurring cycle where mesopotamia grew something happened like a, a large flood or a famine or plague and then it destroyed itself and then it rebuilt and so on and this happens after one of those events specifically a very large famine where mesopotamia begins to outreach to other parts of the world to create colonies and one of those colonies is in egypt and the reason for that is that it was already an established large group of people if you're going to start a colony or new civilization you will need a large group of people to begin that base and that was one of the places selected because it was previously part of the mesopotamian empire on the fringes so they were aware of this location but it was also far enough out to provide if a civilization did grow and even if it wasn't specifically tied as a colony it could be a outer um, civilization that could provide trade um, in the future for various things that Mesopotamia couldn't provide or a second food source if required um, things like that so it was creating hedging bets to make sure they could potentially survive in the future so what happened was that certain individuals from Mesopotamia that were already well developed and well cultured and we looked at shamanism and how it was the shamans and the people with knowledge that drove the development of Mesopotamia that had the knowledge to set up civilizations and these individuals were sent to various places in the world one of them being Egypt where this current tribe or group of people already existed and even though it's the beginning of the journey it's actually quite an important part and quite a large subject to cover you would think that yes the starting community wouldn't have much knowledge because it's the beginning but actually it was more like a injection of knowledge into that area and so we have to establish what was given and why and the vast kind of wealth of that knowledge that was brought to the area at that time and that is actually the basis of what we're going to follow is it's almost a complete system of study and understanding in like a data packet given to these people that would then carry on and be preserved and considered sacred knowledge and the first individual we're going to look at is a man called
Athos. And Athos, also known as Thoth, was an individual that obviously a lot of people in the spiritual community have heard of, a lot of people in the historical community have heard of, but we've all heard different things and different versions. And obviously Thoth was regarded as a god. Now, we really need to spend a lot of time, and unfortunately this is going to be the focus of this part of the video for the first section of the series. And it might seem a little bit off topic talking about gods when it's to do with history. However, I think this subject is extremely undervalued, under talked about, because there's nobody, I've never heard anybody discuss what we're going to discuss now, and that's not a claim of trying to get you to watch the video, this is just a fact that we don't look at the idea of the gods in the correct way as a modern day society. Now what I need to just try and get you to open your mind to, and just bear with me on this, is that we look at history from our eyes now, and bear in mind that's like five over 5,000 years in the future our world now is completely different to theirs and it's not we look at it as a physical sense yes we've got houses books clothes all these different things amenities running water gas we know about electricity and the internet but it's not actually about that it's about the mindset because actually the human brain was just as advanced then as it is now but it had less distractions it had less variations less things to think about because of all these different things we have now imagine being in solitary confinement being in a cave these people have probably lived underground for generations due to um, perceived threats of outside world and that's what the tunnels under the pyramids were for and because if you think about it it was a desert at the end of the day yes there was the Nile but these people didn't have necessarily the means to travel that far up into the into the north from where they were even though it wasn't that far away but to them it was further because they didn't have transportation like we do now hot desert um you know dirty water the threat of possible flood again um and the heat it's not like what we think is a small journey now just to the nile or just to the delta it wasn't a small trip and these people were scared of an incoming flood because that's what they've been ingrained in their culture that it could happen at any time and so they lived in tunnels under the ground and in caves under the sand which is what the pyramids were um, kind of built on top of and the original pyramids um, that actually did exist before this period because we have to remember that Mesopotamia and other cultures actually existed in Egypt before this great cataclysmic flood that did happen and that's shown because of the destruction of Mesopotamian civilization that reached out to Egypt in the first place and again without going too far back but you know we're not going to look into that in this video but there was something there and although it might not have existed as the pyramids we saw today at the time it was still a mound an important position that would be rebuilt on later and we need to understand that the conscious mind is the same thing as we have today, except it's used in a different way, it's understood in a different way. So people were not less smart or less advanced or what we call savage being tribal. They were just as smart, just as able to interpret the world around them. They just didn't look at all these things we have around us today and it allowed them to look inwards internally a lot more and to look at the heavens and the stars and understand things in a very different way than we do now but on the same intellectual level and we need to look at that in that point of view and a lot of the things we understand today that have become embedded in our culture such as God and gods did not mean or were perceived in anything like the way we think they are now so when we hear the word god 
our gods. We see it in a very different way. And it's like the, the Christianized version of the higher, the man, the god, the all-powerful man, but, you know, isn't... And even that isn't the way that Christians first created it in the first place. That's something that was developed later. And even the afterlife and the underworld and death, it was all seen in a completely different way and understood in a different way that we see now. Because we've been... Um, we've diluted it, we've changed it, we've altered it, and we've got kind of cultural associations that didn't exist then. So when they say gods, it's not what we think, they think they mean is a god. And that's important because we have to look at history and culture and knowledge at the time of the people understanding it, not how we would think it is now looking at it then. And it's extremely difficult to get your head round and it's took me a long time to do and it's actually a very difficult mental process to be able to do that, to be in there shoes and visualize and it's being able to understand the spiritual side of things of what works in actual now spiritual practice because those things worked then as well and if you don't understand that then it's difficult to see why they did things but if you know what the end goal is you can work out why they did and understood and explained the things they did in the way they did which is what we're trying to understand here in this series but please see this as an open mind but when they say gods and god it's not what we think it is now and we're very dismissive of that because we say oh yeah you know they're not very clever people had nothing else to consider it's flights of fancy superstitious nonsense and we disregard it as any kind of truth but unfortunately that's the point is that there is so much truth in it because we don't understand what they mean and that's what I'm going to try and explain to you today. So, again, it's a very singular topic, this video, but it is important because it sets the stage for understanding throughout the rest of the series. Because we have, if we have a bad foundation, the rest will not make sense. We must explain this factor. So, we have this individual called Toph, or Atophis, which is a historical figure that arrived around 3400 BC, roughly. And that is before any other civilization in Egypt existed at that time, post the fall of the previous civilizations. And this individual turned up with a wealth of knowledge. Now, when we talk about the gods, because there is actually 12, at that time there are 12 gods. And with symbolism, just like we've seen in the other videos in my channel, a symbol can be manifested or represents some various levels of vibration or understanding. So, for example, the yin yang can be applied to the human body, it can be applied to a single joint of the body, it can be applied to an energy, um, to a, a chemical experiment, to the positive and negative force within atom, to physics, to the planets rotating. It's a concept that can be applied to everything. And that's what happens at that time because they understand the links between them and how they relate. So by mentioning something on one vibrational level it allows you to understand it on others, but it's given the same name because it's like an echo. And that's the microcosm, macrocosmic level, which is given, which is something that we'll look at, but Toph actually teaches to kings to come and that is one of the most important teachings he brings it's the foundation stone for our future knowledge because it's a universal truth it's a fact physics has the equal and opposite forces of reaction it's exactly the same it's just in a different way of looking at it. and so when we talk about specific gods what they mean is multi-levered and what we actually look at in history, when we talk about the gods, is that we have the story of creation. Every culture has a story of creation. And this usually has various gods or you know, names of gods in it, but they all generally describe roughly the same set of 
actions and some of them are extent because it remember it's word of mouth and stories and that's what we have for entertainment so it gets embellished a little bit however when we look at the story of the creation for egypt there's many different versions and we have to separate them and we have to find out what's what's fact and what's fiction what could be a like usable and what isn't and we look at that by repetition into the future but we're not going to look too much into the future but we'll see that the same stories reoccur over and over again as we move on but what is important is that we see there are actually two groups of Egyptian gods there is the original group which are the story of creation which has individuals like Ra and even Toph is mentioned there because as we'll see it means two different things and what the common theme is that the first set of gods gets overruled by the second set of gods and it's usually the child of the head god so in this case Ra's children unseat Ra and they become the new gods and rule the empire and this is something we see for example in the titans in Greece which we will look at because it's not a coincidence and what that symbolizes is the birth of a new civilization the change because the change from the old gods to the new represents a changing rulership and these second set of gods are more relatable more involved in the human affairs and cultures within the civilization because they're closer to the earth they're more like more real people they're just on a higher level to the tribal people because they imagine travelers from Mesopotamia that know about civilization have seen things the tribal people were just coming out of caves have never even conceived of or heard of before we're gonna look like gods or beings of power and that's what the original God concept means it's just a person above a higher being with more knowledge it doesn't necessarily mean spiritual and terrestrial and uh, creates planets it's all symbolism and so what we have is this group of people coming from Mesopotamia to supplant the concept of the old gods which the tribal people used to explain the creation of the universe because they become more real because these people still very important still amazing still working feats of wonder they become more important than these gods that we were told and these people show them things they go i can make this golden tablet or i can show you how to make structures and divert water and create buildings and teach you things you've never heard of they're gonna think well yeah these people are real because they're in front of me doing it and they will then say well your old gods are you know gone you know they don't exist anymore or they're, they're more higher on a higher level or something like that but in the past and that's where the story comes from of the new gods coming to supplant the old the the sons supplanting the fathers and that's what we have is these 12 individuals that come and teach people and begin to build the civilization and it's written that Osiris and Toth come and start teaching and giving gifts of knowledge to the people. That's just a fact. And those are the two, well, there's three we need to really look at. It's Osiris, Isis and Toth. We'll look at the others as we move on. But those three are the ones that give knowledge to the people and the tribes. And we will look at this concept because if you... If you come to build a new civilization where there is already people and you need to sway those people into becoming friendly, you're not trying to enslave them or bully them into doing what you need them to do. You want them to trust you, to become your civilization, to become your children. You incorporate the truth into what they already know. And they already have these stories in their system of um, Ra and you know using these names big names about the creation of the universe and you don't just delete them and say look you're wrong you incorporate you add on to you develop and you change and you manipulate and you 
add stuff in to make it a new phase of the story rather than delete the old ones to gain the trust. And so that's why in the Egypt, a lot of the gods have animal heads. And it's a very simple fact because early tribal shamanism is all about animalism. It's all about connecting to what's around you, which are animal spirits, animal um, intentions and feelings. And it's all about the things you see, the sun, the moon, the wolf, the scorpion, the spider, all these sorts of things. And so we give the gods the animal likenesses in the drawings because it's shamanic. They're trying to tie it into the old ways of the tribal community that already exist. So it can't completely change, it has to intermingle, which is where we get the problems then, because if there's a celestial being called Toph, for example, that has, he actually gives birth to an egg, and the egg births Ra, and um, that's why he has a heron's head, because it's he's like um, a, a bird that has an egg, which gives birth to the sun. But then there's also a man called Toph who adopts the name because he's trying to imitate part of their culture. So he adopts the name to gain trust to become a part of their current culture. And what happens there is then you get both names and that's why we have two different stories for the same name. And that's how it happens. And that's where the confusion comes in because the Egyptians will refer to one as both because that's how they understand it and that's how it was taught and that's how people just knew it but us looking at it now get confused because how can this person be Ra's father and Ra's son and give birth to the son but also be the son that was married to someone else and a different time frame and did this and that and the other and it becomes incomprehensible and therefore we go okay it doesn't exist doesn't mean anything it's nonsense but it's because it's two different people one is a concept that was passed on since the beginning of the, the tribal community. The other is a person that arrives to adopt the name and gives out knowledge. And that's how it works. And unfortunately, we have to accept that. And we have to accept that they saw things in a different way and they explained things in a different way because they understood the link that these two people had knowledge, but in different ways. And they, that's how it that's how it was built and when the Egyptians mention one thing they often mean several things at the same time and so we have to cut through that and we have to say well there are two different types of well there's actually three different types of gods and the meaning of gods the first is the original which is the story of creation and the, the creation of um, planets and everything else like that there's a second level of gods which are those who came from Mesopotamia who set up the civilization who were far greater in knowledge and understanding and wealth than the tribal people there who created the ruling people, the ruling court as it was and then there are the figurative versions of the gods and we see this later on in other systems like Greece and Rome where each god actually represents a um, emotional or mental um, aspect that can be channeled into because it's like well for example um, Seth is the god of war and if someone wants to become warlike everybody can have or become a, a state of warlike being because it's the defensive part of the personality and so that's what describes Seth it's like well so he can be this great god of the creation of the world he can be the ruler of that period of time but it can also represent that warlike state in every individual that can be manifested and channeled when they need to go to war or defend or to describe an angry person and so we have three phases of it and three understandings of all the gods but what we need to take from this is that at this point in time 12 individuals became the ruling court of the Egyptians over the tribal people which they accepted as their leaders at the time and that sparks off the great civilization of Egypt in that position point in time and the person we focus on most is Toph or Atophis which becomes the first pharaoh of the age 
And that's extremely important, because it's him that passes on the first wealth or packet of knowledge that we need to look at. So again, it's extremely complex and in-depth and something we need to break down, understand, because this gets mentioned again and again and again and again. And if we don't get it into our understanding on the first point, then those that later down the line will make less and less sense and have less and less value of importance. But it's this concept of the 12 that we need to look at. So what they understood as, as shamans, as that's what they were, is that the universe generally divides itself into 12 aspects, like we have the 12 zodiac signs, which is interesting because the horoscope represents Horus, and it's horoscope, which is to do with the 12 measurements of the Earth's rotation around the sun, but specifically, obviously, within using the stars as a reference point. But equally, everything is a 360-degree circle of a cycle, but we generally divide it into 12 portions of varying states or visual kind of differences. Um, you could divide it into 360 sections, but obviously that's too much, and the gradient would be quite small between each section. So these 12 specific points of change representing different points of human consciousness. And this is where we get the 12s all the way through time, um, which we will look at. It will become quite important. It gets mentioned continuously. Um, and so the 12 represent 12 parts of the core because the 12 can create a civilization between them because they all have different roles so each god or court member has a role to play and for example so we have Seth who becomes the king of a god of the underworld now we know that there is an underworld and that is the world underneath the pyramids and the tunnels the culture already exists and when they save a lower kingdom, at this point in time, because things do change as things develop, the lower kingdom is actually the kingdom underground. As strange as that may seem, but that's why it's called the underworld, because it's under the world, it's underground. Because these people have a community, a large community, which is seen in other parts of the world, all over, well, even large city complexes have been built underground at that time and these people still half live under there because it's safe because they don't know how to build buildings yet and you're in the middle of the desert so where else are you going to see shelter and that's where Seth was he lived and ruled these people underground and helped them and created this society and developed it underground whereas at the time for example Osiris was the ruler of the upper kingdom which is at this point in time above ground which he will then build when he starts putting in buildings and all these outside shelters and he becomes the ruler of the upper king and so we have two brothers Seth and Osiris one ruler of the underworld at this time and the other the world above ground the normal side of things the side of light which is obviously to do with the sun and things like that we have off, which is, he's kind of seen as the philosopher or the shaman or the prophet, and he actually his bloodline is what we're going to look at, and he actually um, starts a bloodline, that's his job, so he starts a bloodline within the tribal people because he wants to merge and become closer to the tribe, so he takes a wife and has a child which becomes the first pharaohs and that's what we look at and that might sound confusing because of the conflicting stories with Osiris being king, but we'll look at that next, in the next part of this video, um, because that is also a very important thing we need to look at as we pass on knowledge. And and then we have, obviously, the queen, which is Isis, who rules with Osiris, and again, so we will look at that later down the line in the next video. And then you have people like Anubis and Horus, which are sons of the kings, so we'll look at them separate as well. 
but they all have roles to play within the court. So some manage um, the construction, some manage the um, harvest and things like that. So the goddess of the harvest, for example, would be uh, somebody who would teach them about farming and would have all the knowledge they would need to cultivate the delta. And so they will be considered of the god or goddess of farming and cultivation and food and fertility because that's what they're teaching the people. So each individual has almost a subject that they teach the people to help them cultivate and develop. And instinctively they become the heads of that and monitor what's happening. Like trade, who is always a god of trade because they're the ones who go, well, right, we have this much of this resource and we need something else and they monitor what's incoming and outgoing and they will tell the pharaoh so the court becomes a court the gods are a court that advise the king and the pharaoh because it's the 12 seats around the central it's actually 13 seats you see, or 14 if you count the king and the queen being in the center and then the 12 advisors around the outside and the 12 advisors literally give advice on their current subject that they're cultivating and so the king and the queen can make decisions based on this information and this is a ritual so this is where we start to look at the spiritual side of history because if you haven't the problem is that a lot of historians don't know anything about spirituality and they've never practiced ritual or shamanistic actions to create enlightenment or cultivate spiritual consciousness equally many people who do develop spiritual consciousness do rituals have no care for history so we have this middle ground where you need to understand history to understand the times but you also under have to understand the processes of spiritual development and how it's used and what practices there were to get the middle ground and the understanding which is something we're doing here in this series so to have a spiritual development, to use the higher mind, you have a ritual. And the ritual involves the meeting in the court of the Twelve with the king and the queen in the center. And this is extremely important because it's like what we have when we have a board meeting. It's as simple as that, but with a lot of bells and whistles, we have a board meeting. And all the individuals and advisors give their current position. The king and queen take it under advisement and they discern the best course of action to move forward. But it was very ritualistic because it's shamanism, because it was brought from Mesopotamia. It's how they ran their cities, so it's got ties, it's got mimicry, and it's got links. And they use the same symbol symbolism to explain things on different levels. Because we have to remember that these people are so intellectually and spiritually evolved than we are now because they're using the same amount of brain energy and kind of understanding levels of interaction with the mind but have far less distractions than we have now because it's imagine running a city here it's nothing it's far far beyond running a city then even though it's such a big feat because the size and scales are completely different but they look at it in using the shamanic ways of understanding where we are in the seasons what needs to be planted when what effects that's going to have on people and the tribal communities habits and personality groups and psychological effects and they're trying to mimic and copy the cycle of the universe because what they're trying to make is a civilization that's actually in tune with the universal cycle. Because that's what shamanism is. It's trying to balance the universe and create the positive development at the same time. And so they're using the universe itself to try and build a city that meets those same systems and cycles and processes that the universe is mimicking itself from the greater macrocosm and so we see how complex it can be so when they start looking at expanding the city it all depends on the time of the stars 
And that might seem really far-fetched to people in the modern day because we don't do it. But actually what we're doing is we're trying to say, well, the universal cycle promotes a certain level of psychological development at this specific time where people are more likely to be in the mindset to expand and create war. So it's at this point we will then expand and maybe invade and expand into the next tribe over to try and recruit more people. As the city grows okay so now it's spring so it's the time for harvest so we'll concentrate on because remember people are a resource and at the time the tribe although large is not that large compared to like a city and so they can probably only do one thing at a time so they either go to war or they grow crops we can't do both at the same time so if you time a war at the wrong time then you can't harvest your crops which means the next cycle the new people starve. So things have to be very complex. Like nowadays we have enough people where we can grow crops or import them and run business at the same time. Back then it was business or grow crops or start a family. You can't raise kids and do other things at the same time. You can't have everyone building cities and buildings and building the pyramids, for example, later on down the line if they're too busy growing crops, which is what we need to feed themselves in the future. So you have to time these things perfectly. And it's all to do with the mood and the cycles and energy of the seasons and everything else. And this is the knowledge they brought with them. This is the scale of information that's already been tried and tested in Mesopotamia. That's already worked by the massive environmental disasters that they're trying to mimic and develop and teach to these new tribal people because these people are still people and they will die and they need to pass that on to the next pharaohs quickly because it's a lot of information and to teach a tribal leader this in maybe 10 20 years because remember lifetimes are a lot shorter back then you know that's very difficult because you need them to understand the same level of knowledge you know to be able to pass it on, if not more. Because now you're adding into it more tribal specific context because now you are you know this knowledge but you have to apply it to the people you're working with so actually it becomes more complex. So you have to be able to teach all this information and keep it pure for the next generation while trying to interact it and develop it and put it into practice and utilize it in the right time so these courts of 12 with the king and the queen in the center were extremely important and they were ritualistic to make it like the, the 12 courts would know so each individual knows when it's their time so that the king doesn't have to he can concentrate on what to do with it because if you're the god of farming and that's your speciality, you will know when to plant certain crops and when in the season things need to change. And so it's your job to stand in the ritual at the right time of year and say, it's my time of year, we need the people for this, this is what needs to be done. And you stand in the predominant position and it's the same every year. So this court might, let's say for example, meet monthly which is quite interesting because it would meet monthly and it would people in the court would stand in the right positions and do the right actions at the right times of year according to what needs to be done in their roles to guide the people and this court and this role and this advisory system is something that was passed down from then to now that's what we're following one of the things we're following is this knowledge that's been passed on and that is an important part of our history and culture that we've forgotten but it still exists it's still in our culture we just a lot of us don't know it because again we're talking about maybe a couple of hundred people in the tribe now we're talking about millions if not billions because we see the world all work people as one tribe because we have intercity intercountry connections now it's not 
country by country, everything affects everything. So really, the planet is one tribe. So billions of people have access to this knowledge, whereas before it was just a small group of 112. So that's the scale we're working with and it must change over time. That's what we're going to look at, the change and how it influences and develops. So that's one of the things we need to look at that starts in this period of time. And again, this is a very long video because it's a very important topic that needs to be discussed and stamped. Now, there are two other main things that Toph brings to us at this time, along with this knowledge and this court. and. We're going to look very briefly at those, and two of them are linked together, and it's this mysterious story about an emerald, emerald tablet. Now, the emerald tablet, what we all know as the emerald tablet, we claim from Toth, but a lot of it is kind of misconstrued and, and based in mystery. However, the real emerald tab tablet that we know actually comes later down the line and is written from the Hermetics which is in Egypt but much later time and that's what we know as the Emerald Tablet however there is an earlier version and it's said that Toth made an Emerald Tablet and he, he used it to teach the science of the time now the one we know of later is clearly a, a translation from that or a um, a word of mouth interpretation which finally gets written down. What we do know is that what is on the Emerald Tablet is actually what he said and what he taught and it's part of his information passed down. Because remember, if there's this vast amount of information, if you need to pass it on to the next generation, you need to simplify it, condense it down so that then they can then teach it, pass it on and then expand it back out and apply it to their world. So it's easier to break it down into its foundations than to try and give it off as massive chunks and it creates consistency. So the Emerald Tablet is probably something he did right, but it's also something that's passed down word of mouth from Pharaoh to Pharaoh. Now, the Emerald Tablet itself is, again, we can only really go off the one we see that's written down from the Hermetics. Um, but the gist of it, or the, the core teachings of it, are the same as what he would teach. And it's interesting because these are actually the same core concepts as what we learn in shamanism and the laws of shamanism. It's just words in a different way. And it's all to do with, it's very long-winded and obviously in more symbolic terms and interpreted in very different ways. But essentially, it's... The beginnings of spirituality and the way to unlock knowledge of the universe but it's basically just talking about the macrocosm and the microcosm which we've already explained the duality of the world and how these things interact within the human body it's actually quite simple and easy to understand and it's things we will look at as we go but what's important is that the emerald tablet whether it be physically real or not was still something passed on at that time and that's what's important and it would have been written down at some point because we knew that Toth actually started to introduce hieroglyphs which are the first parts of writing which again is something we'll look at because he teaches people how to write because that's going to be important to pass knowledge down in the future and so it's the beginnings of arts and culture and writing and recording and history, which is what Toth did. And what we'll see is that the Dane Toth gets passed on again and again and again because he is a role that gets played. It's something we'll look at soon. Um, so, yeah, so he brings the Emerald Tablet as well as the court system. The court system of the two go hand in hand. So one is the knowledge being used, the other is the knowledge being passed out. The second, uh, sorry, the third thing that he brings are something called the two pillars. And the two pillars, again, are symbolic. There probably was a physical set of two pillars. Supposedly there was one made out of 
um, gold, or, and then it was one that was made out of emerald again, so it was a green and a gold, and one represented the upper kingdom and one the lower kingdom. And we could go really deep into this, because the two pillars again run through our entire culture. They are the foundation stones of our knowledge and understanding all the way to modern day. And they were so important that we literally put them into everything. And without going into detail, it's things like the two sides of the arch. Um, every doorway has two sides. We have the two pillars of understanding. In Kabbalah, we have the pillar of mercy and the pillar of severity. Every culture, every system has two pillars. And the two pillars represent positive negative forces in all things and also the microcosm and microcosm. So we actually represent four parts because there's the side by side action and the below and above action. And it's something we're going to look at again and again, so don't worry too much about why we're not explaining it fully because again you could spend four hours four days talking about the importance and the meaning of the two pillars but the two pillars at the time represented the two kingdoms the upper and the lower and one was built in the upper kingdom one was built in the lower kingdom and again we can look at this physically and say well that represents the the seat of power or the point of energy in the upper kingdom and the lower kingdom which we've already seen one is underground and one is above ground and it kind of represents the unity of the two and if it'd be interesting again there's no evidence to this but it would be interesting to consider the fact that these points or pillars were actually done above each other directly that would be an interesting point of view or fact whether that's true or not i don't know it's just a speculation but if if i had the same understanding of spirituality and the universe as I have now and I was building the pillars and it was an above and below ground pillar I would try and seek to put them directly under the top of one another but that's just me when we have the upper and the lower kingdom in the future they're actually both above ground and the lower kingdom is actually up near the Nile and the upper kingdom is actually further down the Nile river itself which is kind of the opposite of what you would think but each has a pillar done it, uh, built in it but that's a symbolic pillar built later to represent the original pillars built by Toth as kind of a, a symbolic act of yes now both kingdoms are above ground and we both rule them together as one king which we'll look at later um, but equally, the two pillars represent the two sides of personality, the extreme. So we have extreme kindness and extreme um, badness or severity. It's action and passive, and it's the king and the queen. It's exactly the same as yin yang in Taoism. It's the same meaning. So every king has to have an equal queen. It's the balance. It's every... Um, action of good has to have an action of evil. It's every, you know, every son has um, a, a father. It's it's one of those dualities that always exists. Every atom has a push and a pull, and that's what they're trying to get at with the two pillars. And the lower kingdom is also described as the mind, whereas the higher kingdom is described as the universe and the solar system. And it's linking the two together. So again, yes, there are physical ones, but yes, there are also spiritual ones. It's an analogy that transcends various levels of understanding. And so the upper pillar can be described as the universe. And it mimics the same system as the lower pillar, which is in the mind. And so when one thing affects one, it affects the other. And we can learn about it through both. And again, it's the macrocosm, microcosm aspect of it which again is repeated so you see how the concepts are actually quite simple but just applied to multiple layers of reality and understanding and that's how Egyptian concepts work and if you don't understand that or you don't want to understand or you can't get around that then what you know you're going to struggle understanding cutting through all the myths and legends because that's what it is that's how it works and it gets passed on through time 
And and so the two pillars are balance, which becomes the balance or the scales of Egypt, which we see continuously through time, historically drawn and carved and talked about and written about. It's the two pillars of balance and it's the afterlife and current life which is something again we will look at but those are another set of two pillars which have a different meaning than what we say now life and death to them was very different to how it is now and actually their version of life and death is more realistic um, and actually more true because ours has been diluted and changed and we have negative connotations through various religions and things like that as we go um, so it's all that emotional baggage we've acquired along the way gets stripped away and we find the original meaning back in Egypt and it's the balance of scales that we need to look at and again we will look at in this in one of the series videos we will dedicate to the scales specifically and how that works and so we start to begin to see just how important this starting point is when these 12 individuals and specifically Toth comes and becomes the first pharaoh and he brings an entire civilization's worth of information knowledge culture and practices to this tribal community and that is our starting point for our line of knowledge you could say obviously it came from somewhere else that's fine and that's the truth but this is where we're going to start in our line of knowledge and how it's developed up until now. So we're looking at the first pharaoh, Atothis, and his court that arrived in Egypt roughly 3400 BC and began the culture and civilization of this period, this time. And this is our starting point. And this is our first individual on our line that we're going to begin with so i hope you've enjoyed it again thank you for bearing with me it's been a long video but there's been a lot to cover um so break it into bite i hope you break it all down to bite size the next steps of videos will be hopefully a little bit shorter um and more concise because once we've covered the foundations it's easy to apply them to new cultural systems and things as we move on because if you already understand what we're talking about then we don't have to recover so please watch the videos in order um you know and followers like us subscribers and because it's going to be a long series and you want to make sure you keep up to date with it as it comes please subscribe and turn on the notifications because we are just barely scratching the surface of our journey to come into history we've got over 5,000 years to cover a lot of individuals a lot of events lots of knowledge and information that can be applied to our modern day lives so I hope you've enjoyed it please spread the word and support the channel so that's it for now thank you very much and bye bye hello and again welcome again to our sacred history and we're looking now at the beginning of our journey we spent the last two videos kind of building up to that and where we're using our starting off point is at the beginning of the major um, egyptian culture when it starts to grow and then um, there are obviously points before that which I know that will get asked um, in the comments and the sections later but there's a reason why we're starting here and we will look at the points before that as we go back um, in, in another series or a later topic but for now this we're going to use this as a starting point because it's the beginning of uh, a specific period and line of knowledge and development within the um, Western culture and there's a few things it's, quite, it's going to be quite a big topic uh, in this first video because we've got a lot to cover so we're probably going to break it down to multiple parts and 